Well, good evening again. Uh, hopefully had a couple moments to uh, look through these opening discussion questions and just reflect a little bit on uh, how is your communication? Hey, Kyle, I'm still coming through that monitor. <laughs> um, tonight, that's going to be our topic of discussion, talking through communication as a couple, um, how to develop maybe some healthier communication and just some real practical, tangible tools of things that we can implement just to cultivate a culture of healthy communication. And again, just to reiterate what I, what I said a couple weeks ago and what we talked about last week, uh, none of us are professional marriage counselors. And so again, I'm not up here as an expert saying I've got communication nailed. Uh, I do not have communication nailed down, still very much learning and growing. Uh, so again, tonight we get to be sort of... Uh, co-travelers together on this journey of what healthy communication looks like in marriage. So again, just a, a couple preliminary things I want to talk to. Um, this first is this idea that, again, transformation is better than technique. Uh, last uh, time I talked about this, two weeks ago, I phrased it this way. We often want tools before transformation. We, we like this idea that there's something really practical that I can take and I can plug in and just do. Uh, but the reality is, is that there's no technique I can give you that will help you have really healthy communication if your heart just isn't in it. And so again, what's better than any sort of communication technique I can give you is a heart of just genuine interest and concern for the well-being and flourishing of your spouse. So uh, a man by the name of Michael Nichols, he wrote a book called The Lost Art of Listening. Highly recommend it. Uh, he said this, he says, there's a difference between showing interest and actually taking an interest. And sometimes we're really good at pretending to show interest, but not very good at actually taking an interest. And so tying this back into that idea that transformation is more important than tools is this idea that I, I can't give you a tool that will help you cultivate a genuine, genuine interest in the flourishing and well-being of your spouse. And that's why the gospel has to be at the center of a healthy marriage. Jesus has to be transforming you and changing you from the inside out, empowering you to be someone who lives and loves selflessly, who has a genuine interest in communicating and opening up a life of intimacy with your spouse. So I think of it this way. Uh, Lauren and I, when we first got married, we moved to Chicago and we became house parents for at-risk youth in our first year of marriage. That was the first mistake I made in marriage, was taking on such a stressful role. So Lauren and I lived in a house with seven children aged seven and under. Not our kids, from backgrounds of pretty substantial emotional trauma. And before we even got in the house, we had to go through 160 hours of training. And that's what I realized, like, I don't think this is like glorified babysitting. This is real stuff. And so this whole model was based on what they called teaching social skills to youth. And so for us, one of, one of our key social skills that they're trying to get uh, kids ages three to seven to learn is the skill of following instructions. So they broke it down into steps and to follow instructions, you look at the person, say, okay, do the task and check back. That's how you teach the social skill. So in, in our training, they're talking to us about how to teach these social skills, how to affirmatively praise the children and how to record this all in their daily chart. And so what they do is they say, all right, now we're going to send you guys into the homes where you're going to be living and working uh, for the rest of your time here. And we, we want you to practice this. So we're out playing with the kids and we had a, a five-year-old boy named Ryan. And, and I, I gave Ryan an instruction and he looked at me, he said, okay. He ran and did what I asked him to do. And he came and he said, checking back. And part of me was like, whoa, th th this really does work. And, and so I walked through the, the, the teaching skill. I said, Ryan, great job following instructions. You looked at the person. You said, okay, you did the task and check back. When you follow instructions, you're more likely to have time to do things you enjoy. Does that make sense? And he said, yep. And that was the whole teaching instruction we were supposed to do. And then he looked at me and he goes, did they teach you that in training? <laughs> and I thought like, here I'm this d adult doing this significant thing, teaching this child. And he just totally was like, yeah, you, you flipped into robot mode, right? Because there was this moment in his mind where you went from being Aaron to, to reciting a script that was given to you, right? And suddenly it didn't seem genuine and it didn't seem authentic. And, and, and I think the danger of that is the danger that's true of communication techniques, right? We can give you tools and we can give you techniques. And if you take those techniques and you go and plug and play them in your marriage, your spouse is going to say, this is really annoying, 
right? Because it doesn't work to take a script and just plant it in if genuine interest and concern isn't there, right? So two weeks ago, we talked about this idea from 1 Corinthians 13. Paul said, if I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but don't have love, I'm only a resounding gong or clanging cymbal. So tonight I want to present to you the uh, ACPV version, the Aaron Cloud uh, paraphrased version. So I'm going to say it this way. Though I know all the communication tools and the right questions to ask, if I do not have love, I'm a resounding gong or clanging cymbal, right? We, we can give you check-in questions. We can give you some great tools and things to implement. But if you don't genuinely love and have a, a sense of concern and genuine interest in your spouse, none of this stuff matters. So part of the question I want us to wrestle with tonight is, is how is your heart? And, and Proverbs speaks to this. It says, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. And so effective communication begins with a healthy heart. How is your heart spiritually? What kind of influences, what things are you allowing to have access to your heart? Elsewhere, it says this in Luke chapter six, this is Jesus teaching and he says, a good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. Catch this, he says, for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. So when you think about your communication, when you think about your daily interactions with your spouse, when you think about what's coming out of your mouth, what are the words that you're speaking and the way that you're communicating, what does that say about the condition of your heart? Because usually um, harsh words equal uh, time for heart check, right? When, when we're snappy, when we're, we're quick to sort of bite back or to be sarcastic, when we have a lack of patience or there's a resentment that's built up that we start to communicate, uh, it's time to say, okay, what's going on in my heart? How am I spiritually? How is my walk with Jesus? How, how's my prayer life? How's my time in the word? Because those things directly affect how we interact and how we build intimacy with our spouse. So good communication is not just uh, saying nice things or, or about your spouse or, or, or having sort of deep emotional conversation, but it's communicating genuine love, care, and affection and concern for the well-being of your spouse. So that's what I want to dive into tonight with the context and the framework of understanding that it begins with a good and healthy heart rooted in the transforming power of Jesus who enables us to love in a self-sacrificial way. Still with me? We tracking? All right, should we dive in? Okay, so let's talk about just some real practical elements of communication. One of my favorite questions to ask uh, couples is, are you a good or bad communicator? Uh, we phrase it this way in the discussion questions, uh, how, how is your communication uh, as a couple? And usually when I ask this question, uh, one person or the other will say either they're a bad communicator or I'm a bad communicator. Usually they point to the other person because we're never the bad communicator, right? If, if my spouse could learn to communicate well, then we would be fine, but it's, it's Lauren's fault. And I can say that because she's not here tonight, right? Um, and, and I usually follow that up with this question. What do you mean by the idea that they're a bad communicator? What makes them a poor communicator? And the answer to that question is usually a little bit more fumbling around. They can't maybe quite put their finger on it or they just haven't thought about it. All they know is that the way their spouse communicates with them doesn't hit a core need of how they need to be communicated with. And so one of the things that I run into is just the difference in being an emotional versus a cognitive communicator. Now, a cognitive communicator is someone, this is a logical, rational person that when they communicate, they're going to relay information and they're going to communicate in a very rationalistic, logical flow of thought. So if you ask the cognitive communicator, how was your day? They're going to give you their agenda. I had a meeting in the morning and then I went to this and then I turned in this project to my boss and then I went and worked in this field. They're going to communicate the logical, rational flow. Now, the emotional communicator, uh, they're going to tell you, if you ask them, how was your day? They're going to describe how they felt and how the activities that they engaged in, the meetings that they went to, the things that they did, how those things made them feel. And so what often happens is like ships uh, missing in the night, when you ask, how's your day? And one communicates cognitively and the other communicates on an emotional level. One's not necessarily better than the other. Both are needed, but we often assume that the other person will communicate in the way that we expect them to. So uh, when you think about how this breaks down, I want you to think about the kinds of interaction that you will have in a typical day. And typically, there's, there's sort of five levels of communication that you will flow in and out of in the rhythm of a day, in the rhythm of a week. And the first level of communication is this. It's, it's cliche conversation. 
This is the kind of conversation that you have with the checkout person at Hy-Vee. So if you go to get groceries at Hy-Vee, uh, you might have just dropped your coffee in the parking lot and shut your finger in the door. But when you walk up to the checkout line and they say, how's your day? We just say, I'm good. Right? You don't tell them all the nitty gritty details of your day. It's, it's not the right context. And so we usually engage in cliche conversation about the weather or the cold or the blizzard or the drifting snow. Right? We, we don't talk about sort of substantive heart level matters. And that's not wrong. Cliche conversation isn't bad. In the right context, it makes sense. Because if you start spewing out all of the things that are going on in your heart and life to the cashier, they usually look at you like, uh, I don't know if I should know this, right? You've all, you've all had a friend who's an oversharer. You've experienced that awkward moment where you're like, ah, uh, I don't know if the mailman needs to know about, right? It just, it doesn't make sense. Uh, so after cliche conversation is this idea, uh, reporting facts about others. So it's, it's a little bit deeper than cliche conversation, but it's still functioning primarily on a sort of logical, rational level. It's, it's the transfer of information. You're reporting, here's what happened, here's what took place, here's the agenda of how my day went. Now, level three, uh, you start to get a little bit deeper here, and you're going to start to share ideas and judgments. So here's something I've been thinking about. Let me put forth this idea. Uh, you might ask others, what do you think about this? You might start to give opinions about things. Uh, level two is where we get to, to feelings and emotions. This is where you're going to start to talk about the internal workings of what's happening in your heart and life in the course of a day. And, and level one is sort of complete emotional and personal communication. So what's happening here is at the top, level five, it's, it's very broad. You, your emotional defenses are up and there's minimal risk, Right? There is no risk in having a conversation with the checkout person at Hy-Vee about blowing and drifting snow. That's not going to be an emotionally risky conversation. Now, what happens as we get more focused, as we get deeper, as we move to that level one, you'll see that defenses come down and there's the emotional risk of vulnerability. So when we're communicating at that level two, level one, you're not just talking about what you feel. So you might have a conversation where you, your spouse comes home and says, man, I had a, a really tough day. My, my boss just blew up at me in a meeting. And, you know, they said, you know, what kind of project is this? This is not at all what we were looking for. And so you're going to talk about, you know, I felt really just undercut. I felt undermined. I felt unappreciated. And when you get to that level one, you might talk about like, you know, they really hit some of my core insecurities and I really just feel unvalued. And, and you're going to get to these sort of core heart matter things. Now, that's a negative example, but on, on the positive side, you're going to talk about some of your deepest joys, some of your greatest dreams, some of your greatest hopes. And, and so uh, getting to that level two, level one conversation is really important. Now, the goal here, though, is, is not to stay here, right? The goal is not to say in your marriage, you should only be at this, this level all the time. If you're at level one communication all the time, that's exhausting, right? And I think, by the way, this is why, well, this is my theory anyway. I think this is why men don't like marriage seminars because they assume it's going to be an hour of like sitting knee to knee, hands in hands, eyes to eyes, just communicating these really deep things, right? And it makes us feel really uncomfortable. And so we, we think like sometimes for men, and by the way, just stereotypically, men tend to be more on the cognitive end, and women tend to be more on the emotional side of things in, in terms of how we communicate on that spectrum that I showed you. Not always the case. Actually, in my home, we tend to be reversed. Uh, Lauren is much more logical, rational. I tend to be a little bit more emotional in my communication. So I'm a little more comfortable in that level two, level one than she might be sometimes. Uh, but the, the significant thing, again, not that you stay at level one. The significant thing here is to ask, how are you cultivating an environment where you make sure that you get to this level of communication? Because what often happens is that life is really busy. And so what happens is you wake up in the morning, and, and if you're like me, when I get up in the morning, I have three child drop-offs to do. One at daycare, one at preschool, and one at Dakota Prairie. And I have to have them done by 8.15 on the dot, or the school calls and wants to know why there's an unexcused absence for my daughter, right? So we get up in the morning. That is not the time for me to have a conversation with my wife about level one, complete emotional, personal communication, right? If I attempt to have that conversation in the morning, it's not going to go well. 
But what happens is we wake up in the morning and we start reporting facts about things. We start talking logistics. And so we wake up and we say, okay, we've got a uh, preschool drop off and, and uh, Indy, our youngest, she's got a uh, snack for tomorrow, which is true. So we've got to get uh, cheese and crackers ready to take to her preschool class. And we need to make sure that they have boots and snow pants and that all needs to be packed in their backpack. And, and, and we're talking logistics. Not bad. That needs to happen. This is an important conversation. The challenge is then when we get home, we, we stay here because then there's, there's dinner that has to be done. There's laundry that has to be done. And what we find over time is that we, we essentially live as sort of cohabitating people that, that sort of stay in this level of conversation. We don't leave time and room and space. If you don't intentionally cultivate it, it's far too easy for level two, level one conversation to just get left to the wayside. So part of the, the conversation that I want us to wrestle with is where are you creating time and space to have these core heart level conversations? And, and by the way, as men, we like to pretend that we're tough hearted. We like to pretend that we're not emotional people. But the number of men that I talk to with anger issues tells me otherwise. We're emotional. For a lot of us, we just don't know how to process it and put it into words. And so we sort of stuff it down and repress it, and it comes out often in unhealthy ways. So men, for us, sometimes we have to be willing and able to dive into some of the deeper parts of who we are and be willing to go to this place. So think about the rhythm of your marriage. What does it look like? Where are you leaving and creating time and space to get to that level two, level one conversation? And by the way, again, this is where uh, a lot of that conflict comes up with in terms of conversation and, and communication. It, think of that question, how is your day? So if you come home and, and your spouse walks in the door after a day at work and say, how was your day? Right? If your spouse is a more cognitive communicator, they're going to respond here. They're going to tell you, uh, I had this meeting in the morning, and then I, I led this thing, and then I, I dropped off the car to get fixed, and uh, then I went and picked up the kids, and, and now here I am. Good day. Now, if you're an emotional communicator and you ask, how was your day? They tend to respond here, and they're going to tell you not just what happened, but how what happened made them feel. And so what happens oftentimes is, is you walk in the door, you ask, how was your day? And the cognitive communicator tells them their agenda, and the emotional communicator goes, why didn't they tell me how their day was? They didn't tell me how anything made them feel. And, and you have this conversation, but you don't feel like you had connection. And, and it's not that the level two conversation is better than the level four. Both are important. It's just that you're assuming that your spouse will communicate to you in the way that you're used to being communicated with. And sometimes you have to trust that when your spouse tells you at a level four how their day was, that that's how they process it. Does that make sense? So let's, let's keep rolling here. As we think about then developing good communication and getting used to these rhythms and cultivating this intentionality, I want to give us just some, some quick, simple, clear principles uh, for developing healthy communication. The first is this, create an atmosphere of honesty. Um, and I think there's two key things here. Um, I think honesty is built on a foundation of trust. And, and trust is about the consistency of character over time. And so as, as you journey into marriage and as you are a person of your word, as you fulfill your promises and as you do the things that you say you do, you will do, you, you'll begin to build this atmosphere of trust. Now, the other component to this honest communication is we have to be the kind of people who have the courage to be candid with our spouse. And often I think in marriages, uh, I see conflict emerge and a lot of the conflict is rooted in a lack of candor and an ability to be really honest and vulnerable with each other. And, and so the second principle is this, try to talk about issues before they become a conflict, to which everyone in the room says, well, duh, if it was that easy, we'd do it, right? But, but these two go together. What I mean by this is there's so much conflict that erupts because we weren't willing to have a candid conversation before it became emotionally charged. So what happens is, when we avoid a candid conversation, we repress it and stuff it down. And what gets stuffed and overlook, overlooked gets pressurized. And you keep stuffing and you keep avoiding that conversation and enough pressure builds up. Then in a moment of, of just life stress and anger and frustration, that thing erupts. And now what would have been a candid conversation, it might have been hard, it might have been awkward, it might have been difficult, now becomes an emotionally charged conflict 
right? So, so think about it in the example of something like this. Um, think about even talking about things like sexual rhythms. And, and so one, one person in the marriage will, will think, okay, tonight's t- the night. We're going we're gonna to have sex. It's a moment to be intimate. And you float it by your spouse and they just shoot it down like, no, tonight is not the night. Uh, this has been a crazy day. Not going to happen. Right? And, and one person who feels rejected walks away feeling like part of them was rejected, but they, they never have the conversation about, you know, sometimes I feel like our sexual rhythm is just out of sync and it's not meeting my needs. That, that can be an awkward conversation because it gets at the core part of who we are and just talking about our sexuality, even with our spouse in that way, is sometimes really difficult. And so what happens is we, we, we sort of repress that conversation. We say, oh, we'll come back to that. And we're hurt and wounded and rejected and it builds up pressure over time. And then there's another conflict about something simple, but it's not really about the simple thing. It's actually about that woundedness and rejection that we experienced back here that we never talked about. Is that making sense? So I think so much of marriage has to be built on that foundation of trust where we're willing to talk about honest things and have candid conversations about difficult things. Third is this, uh, communicate your communication needs. And, And I think the logical question is, what are my communication needs? Have you ever thought about like what you need to be communicated with? How do you know when you've really felt heard? Uh, for Lauren and I, we had a season of conflict uh, over c- a communication issue when she would tell me something, and if I did not verbally respond, she wasn't convinced that I heard her. And, and so she would tell me something, and internally I'm thinking, oh yeah, sure, I'll, okay, yeah, we can do that. But I, I wouldn't, I don't know why, just my man brain melting down, I wouldn't say anything to her, and she would get annoyed and frustrated and be like, hello, did you hear me? And so, yeah, I heard, like, what's the problem? But, but she needed me to verbally acknowledge, yes, I hear you. And, and, and for me, that took, like, this weird mental energy to say, like, yes, I hear you. I acknowledge. But it was that simple. And so we had so much conflict over her feeling unheard because I simply didn't get it through my thick head that, oh, you just need me to affirm. Yeah, okay, yeah, I, I hear you. I receive that. I accept that. Um, for me... On the other hand, um, weeks like this where uh, I'm teaching Wednesday night and I'm teaching Sunday morning and there's a lot of meetings, when I go home in the evening, sometimes my brain is just shot, right? And we've got a sick kid at home. Hopefully it's not the influenza stuff. So Lauren's been at home for two days. And so when I walk in the door, she's ready to engage and I'm exhausted. And so we, we have this rule that we call taking a fiver. So I walk in and sometimes I'm like, I want to have a conversation, but I just need to take five minutes. I need to go shut myself in the room and just stare at the wall and talk to no one and think about nothing. And for me, like, I just have to unplug. And so my communication need is I will come back and I will commit to being in a conversation with you, but I I literally do not have the emotional energy right now until I take five minutes to just, like, let my brain lull into a hum of nothing right? And even just communicating those things. I wish I could tell you we had great mature conversations about getting to this point. Most of it was through conflict of like me being half engaged as I'm looking at my phone and she's telling me about her day and then she's annoyed and I'm annoyed because I don't know why she's annoyed, right? And I think just getting to this place where we could communicate what we need in order to feel heard and feel like we've expressed ourselves has saved us a lot of that conflict. Uh, Next, be aware of nonverbal communication. Uh, This isn't This isn't rocket science on this one, but I think it's just to stop and think about how verbally and spatially am I communicating genuine interest in my spouse? Um, So simple things like setting down the phone, turning off the TV, being aware of like if your arms are crossed and you're in a book and your spouse is talking, probably doesn't communicate genuine interest in what they're saying. So just think about what you're, you're, you're physically communicating with your body about an openness and receptivity to what your spouse is saying. Find time for just the two of you. Um, And this doesn't have to be a date night. This doesn't have to be a trip for the two of you to Jamaica. Like often, I think we we sort of save up this relational communication deficit saying on on date night or when we finally get a day away, like then we'll we'll connect. And the problem is you've been so disconnected that those moments, it's like, what what do we talk about as adults again? Like, what? how are you doing, right? But it's been two months since you've had that conversation. So in the rhythm of your week, how do you carve out time and space for just the two of you to sit down and to connect, to just have those heart level conversations where you kind of set aside the distractions? Finally is this, learn how to listen. 
And when we think about communication, I think for a lot of us, we immediately jump to what am I saying? What is my spouse saying? And how do we receive that? But 50% of that, at least, maybe more, is listening. And, and I think there really is a deficit in really listening well, setting aside our agenda to receive what our spouse is saying. So I want to push into this last one for a moment. I know I'm getting close on time, so I'm going to cruise. Proverbs 18.2 says this. It says, fools find no pleasure in understanding, but delight in airing their own opinions. Ouch. Some of us are really good talkers, and it's really easy to say a lot of words. But Proverbs says, uh, this is a foolish thing to never stop and to listen well, to set aside the airing of your own opinions and just to receive. Proverbs 18, 13 later says this. It says, to answer before listening, that is folly and shame. Again, this idea of uh, I'm going to respond to you before I've actually heard what's being said, that's foolish. And, And I think most of conflict, this is what's taking place. When you're in conflict, how many times has your spouse been saying something to you and you're like, oh, I've got the best rebuttal to this. I'm going to shut you down, right? And then you realize like, I don't even know what they said, but this point is perfect, right? And we, we're a culture that loves the mic drop moment, which means the conversation stops, right? So we're just waiting for that moment. We can, we can drop the mic, walk away as the victor. But it's foolish, Proverbs says, to answer before you've even received. So how do we cultivate this practice of listening? Again, uh, Michael Nichols from his book, The Lost Art of Listening, uh, he says this. He says, listening is a silent but strenuous activity. What he means by this is it's not passive. It's not just that you're not saying anything. What he means is you're emotionally engaging and processing what the other person is saying. He goes on to say to really listen is to have to suspend your own agenda. It's to forget about what you might uh, say next and concentrate on being a receptive vehicle for the other person. Genuine listening means suspending memory, desire, and judgment, and for a few moments at least, existing for the other person. And I think in listening, in this part of communication, is where we really see our selfishness come to the surface. Because if we're going to listen well, it means setting aside memory, desire, and judgment. He means in the flow of conversation, don't think back to what your spouse did wrong. Don't, don't think about how you're judging what they're saying or what you need in the moment. He says, in a genuine moment of listening, set that aside for a moment and ask, what is the heart of my spouse trying to get across to me? And and I love that phrase, he says, and for a few moments at least, exist for the other person. Philippians 2 might say it this way, in y'all's attitude, in y'all's relationships have the same attitude as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. Paul might say it that way. To listen is to set aside your agenda and to reach across the table in silence and say, what are you trying to communicate? Um, I want to leave you with just some real practical tools, just real simple things that I think we can implement. Number one is this. Uh, I encourage you to practice a no-tech night. Um, Dave and Heidi, they do this. I kind of stole this from him, but I think it's a great practice. Have a night one day a week where you you put the phones away as soon as you get home. Uh, Dave, you probably shouldn't do this because you have to call me if your wife goes into labor. Uh, We're on duty. So Uh, put the phones away, shut off the TV, computers, laptops, Kindle, iPad, put it all away and play a game together. Have a conversation, a cup of tea. I don't know, whatever you do, like do that as a couple, but do, do a night where you just put the tech away. Uh, second is this, ask the second question. And what I mean by this is I, I think every day in communication, our spouses give us invitations to enter into the next step. And often it just means asking the next question. So if you come home at the end of the day and you ask your spouse, hey, how was your day? And they say, you know, I actually had a really difficult meeting with my boss that didn't go well. And a part of you is like, ooh, sorry. That's, ah, I know that's frustrating. Your boss, what a jerk, right? When, when you could enter that moment and say, so t- tell me about the meeting. What, what happened? Like, how, where, where'd it go wrong? What, how'd you feel in that moment, right? And just asking that second question opens up a whole nother level of conversation. And usually if you're like me, I'm doing this thing of like, okay. Like emotionally they need to enter in. I feel a little like depleted, but sometimes we just have to do the courageous thing and ask that next question, right? Uh, Cultivate appreciation. So two things I I think are just really simple here. When you cultivate appreciation, I think it brings something to life in your spouse. And when you feel appreciated, there's this thing where you go, I just, I want to serve well the person who appreciates what I do for them. And so two ideas I have. One is you could take a dry erase marker and just write on your bathroom mirror things, one thing every day or a couple things every week that you just appreciate about your spouse. 
or buy a, a pad of post-it notes and just every day jot down one quick thing that you appreciate about your spouse. Like, hey, I really appreciate you have coffee ready in the mornings and I don't have to think about it. Boom. Or, or thanks for filling up the car with gas so I don't have to worry about it. Boom. Like, w- what are those simple things that we just, we take for granted every day until our spouse is upset and then we're like, oh yeah, I do appreciate that. I should have told you. Now it's not genuine because we're fighting. So I can tell you I appreciate it, but when you're fighting, it just doesn't have the same ring to it, right? So cultivate appreciation. Uh, engage the spiritual. I think it's really easy to just like the spiritual is something you do individually, but this can be as simple as this. What's God teaching you? How, how's he forming and shaping your heart? That simple question can open up new dialogue. And finally, halt and cultivate health. So halt means hungry, angry, lonely, tired. There's, so, you know, there's these, these sayings, right? Uh, like for sailors, they talk about red sky at night, sailor's delight, red sky in the morning, sailor's warning. Our version of that is our house is, uh, if the kids are up at night, mom and dad are sure to fight. Because there's just this reality when I'm sleep deprived, I'm, I'm not a good person. I just, I get grumpy. I get irritable. Uh, we also have amnesty hours from like 11 p.m. to 6 a.m. when our kids are up at night, like everything's forgiven that happens or is said between those hours when we're sleep deprived. Uh, But sometimes like hangry is a thing. When you haven't eaten and you're just angry, sometimes you just need to draw a boundary and say, you know what? I would love to have a conversation with you, but right now I just need to eat dinner, right? That's okay. So sometimes we have to draw a boundary, cultivate a sense of health, and then be committed to come back and engage in that conversation. Um, these are some check-in questions. I think you have these at your table. Um, I encourage you to use these. That, that first question, how is your heart? It, it feels really broad, but it's a great question to ask your spouse and to be asked to just think about, how is my heart? Um, there's some spicier ones on here, like, how did I best meet your needs this week? Or how did I least meet your needs this week? Those are the kind of conversations like we love to fight about and have heated arguments, but they're much harder to just sit down have that conversation about. But how would it transform our marriages if we had a genuine interest in how have I served you well or not served you well? Um, I'm going to give you a couple minutes to look over these discussion questions. I went a little over, so I'm not going to have a ton of time for these. But as you think about the five levels of communication, uh, what's your default level? So when, when you go to that place of communication, do you go to an emotional place or, or do you tend to be more cognitive in that? Uh, what's your biggest communication struggle right now as a couple? So take a couple minutes, kind of debrief that, push into one of those questions that, that what resonates well. One, two, I'm going to give you guys just enough time to not get into an actual conversation. Um, so we're just going to keep, we're just going to keep moving on tonight a little bit. Um, Before I really dive in, I'm going to start talking about the love languages a little bit. But before we get there, last week I talked about carrying on the conversation after we leave here. Um, So I just want to give a quick plug for you guys. Um, So we have three groups that are meeting after this week that are primarily focused on marriage. Um, So I have a call to action for you. After this, after we're all done, the very last slide will be a QR code, which is you can point your phone, take a picture of it, or you don't have to take a picture anymore, and the link will show up to register for a group. So you can take that action today and register for a group focused primarily on marriage. Um, There are two that are on the list, and there's a little little checkbox that says, I just, I don't, maybe Sunday, maybe Wednesday. Um, I don't know what group yet, but I just know I need to do this. Um, So you can do that when we're done here today. Um, I still, if there's a couple of people who say, you know what, I'd be willing to lead. Um, You can email me, you can sign up for a group and I'll get a hold of you. Um, I'd still love to have a couple more people. So I know there's about half of you that might already be uh, signed up for a group, but there's still about 50 to 60 people who aren't. Um, So I would just say, just keep carrying on this conversation. It's good uh, to be in relationship with other people going through the same thing. I think that's a way that we can grow uh, in our relationships uh, with Jesus and with each other. Um, so that's my, my quick plug before we go on. On your table, there's a QR code. If your kid is in the student ministries, um, they're doing a newsletter. So you can take a, uh, you can put your phone up, same thing, QR code, and they're sending out newsletters. So you can take a picture. I think it explains more on that little piece of paper, Um, but do that before the evening's up as well. Lastly, there's books on the hallway as you leave. Um, We're asking $10 a piece. I'm not bent over that. I want you guys to have resources that are going to equip you in your marriage. Um, So you can check those out on the way out of the door. 
Um, so that being said, I'm going to push on into love languages a little bit. Um, I handed out love languages last week. And so I'm going to make a general assumption, and you guys can help me out with this with a show of hands. If you had either taken it already or took it this last week or are somewhat familiar with it, can you please just raise your hand? Okay, so my general assumption was that this is not a new conversation, which is good because I'm not going to speak through each one in depth because when we, we talked about it this week of what do we want this session to really be about. I want to I talk about the why, why love languages is important. And I think even just reading communication, um, communicating affection. I think when we talk about communication, we need to start talking about understanding how do we communicate affection? How do we need to communicate love towards our spouse? Because there's something deep within that. Um, so growing up, I grew up in a household where I remember talking to my mom about this, and it's not true anymore. But when my mom and my dad first got married, my dad told my mom, if you ever need to know that I love you, just ask me and I'll tell you. And that's how they communicated affection. Dad was like, just tell me and I'll tell you I love you. But outside of that, it was understood, right? I'm going to say affection isn't just understood. It doesn't just happen. It's not haphazard. We have to be very intentional with how we communicate affection. So when we talk about love languages, there's a couple things that I, I just want to make known before we dive into this. Um, this is not a comprehensive list or a list when you ex establish what your t uh, highest love languages are. That's not a, this is all that I am and I'm not going to do anything else. No, I want you to be aware of different ways that we can show affection towards our spouse. And the other thing is, we have the tendency to show love how we want to receive it. So there's some self-awareness in understanding our love languages. We often tend to show love how we expect to receive it. So I remember the first couple years of our marriage, we, we, we battled this so much and we didn't even know it because I am an acts of service guy. I, I will do anything. I will do the dishes. I'll clean the house, whatever. I'm, keep me busy. I'll do everything. And so after dinner every night, we would have this dispute of, okay, dinner's done. We spent time cooking together. Let's go sit on the couch and hang out. And I'm like, we have dishes to do. Like, let me go do the dishes. And so my wife is more quality time. She wanted time to be together. I wanted to go show my affection by cleaning the kitchen so it would be done so that we could finally relax. So there's areas of tension where I was trying to say, let me love you by doing the dishes. And she's like, let me love you. Let's just spend time together. Don't worry about the dishes, right? So until we had language to communicate what we truly needed, we continued to butt heads in this. So that's why I think this is very, very important. Um, so let's just, I'm going to move through the, uh, the love languages, just to give you a brief summary of them, and then I'm going to ask a couple core questions that I really think are going to set the tone for what we want out of this session. So we're going to look at the first one is words of affirmation. Um, the, have you guys ever heard the saying is actions speak louder than words, right? That's not always true. If you are somebody, when somebody just tells you, man, I really appreciate it when you did this, if that resonates with you two to three days later, words of affirmation is probably one of your top love languages, right? So it's not always about the doing, but it's the words that you can say, that the things that you can just appreciate and thank about that person. So words of aff affirmation is really where you'll see that come to play. Uh, the next one is quality time. It's quality time. So this is not proximal. This is not just being close to somebody, but this is undivided, uninterrupted, face-to-face -face time where I can sit with no distractions and just listen and be present, okay? This is not, we're in the same room together, you know, folding laundry. That's not quality time. That's how I used to interpret it. I was like, we're at home together all night. How is this not quality? No, it's, it's I, just need, I just need your main, main attention. I need you to focus. Um, and so, side note, if your love language is not quality time, this is one thing that I've learned This is very helpful. Sometimes five minutes of quality time is just what's needed, and then you can get 20 minutes of access service time, right? But if you try to, so how many of you guys have, so I've timed this, right? This, this works very similar with kids. Um, it takes me five minutes to unload the dishwasher. I've, I've timed myself. I know how long it takes. If I have a child who needs me, right, unloading the dishes takes about 35 minutes because it's, hey, what do you need? Oh, hey, good. Dishes is, hey, what do you need? And so this is what it's like when there's somebody in your life that just values quality time. So if you can spend five minutes here, 
and just have uninterrupted time, then there's five more minutes of uninterrupted time where you can continue the things that you're doing. Okay, so just remember quality time, just uninterrupted quality time, face-to-face time. Just don't allow everything else to bombard that time. Be focused and present with, a, with the person, with your spouse. Uh, number three, receiving gifts. Um, don't make the mistake that love languages is materialism. That's not at all what this is about. And this was my biggest mis- misconception when we talked about love languages of like, you are so materialistic, I'm not even going to buy into this one. I'm not buying you a ring every time you ask for something. Right? That's not at all what this is. A lot of giving gifts and receiving gifts is all about the intentionality and the thought that goes behind it. Okay, so maybe your love language is receiving gifts, and hopefully some of you have friends or a spouse that is really good at this. So maybe if you're going on a long trip, your spouse will prepare a little goodie bag for you with things that you truly enjoy. I mean, they're not expensive. Maybe it's like Hershey Kisses and a magazine or something that just says, I'm thinking about you while you're gone. Okay, so that's what receiving gifts is all about. Or maybe you're the one when you're on a trip, you're in the airport and you see something and I was like, man, my wife would really love that. And you just grab it right? Because you're thinking about them when you're not present, okay? That's what receiving gifts is about. It's about intentionality, and you're thinking about that person, and you want to show them your affection that way. Number four is acts of service. Uh, Sometimes in my mind, I'm like, well, duh, you're just doing stuff for somebody else. But I think it's you're going out of your way to show the other person your affection by just doing something simple. So maybe it's like sweeping the floor or, you know, Aaron mentioned earlier, maybe you're filling up the gas for your spouse. You're going out of your way. Like, I know it's empty. I'm going to grab their car and I'm going to go fill it up for them so they don't have to worry about it. So you're, you're trying to take the ease off of somebody else's routine. So when they, when they go to do something, like, oh, that was different. Thank you. Um, so you're, you go out of your way to try to uh, just do some active service for your spouse. Uh, and the last one is physical touch. Um, and disclaimer, this is not all about the bedroom. Uh, this one has primarily to do with just you, you're intentionally engaging with that person in a very proximal way. Um, so one of, the, one of the funny examples you can say is, so you have a couch and a chair in a living room, right? If my wife was on the couch and I go sit in the chair, we're together, that would be offensive, you know, because some people like the physical touch of just sit next to me. I just want to be close, um, especially around friends and family, just giving them an extended hug or just kissing them before you go. Um, so that's what physical touch is. So we're going to keep moving on, but the, the question that we kind of want to ask is, why is this important? Why is this important? There's two things that I really want to hit on tonight. This will kind of be the main focus of this session. There's two big takeaways that I think we can take out of this. Um, The first one, I think I have it in here, is is receiving. Is that what I put? Yeah, is is receiving. Um, Receiving love. So once we begin to understand what the love languages are, it should help us understand what it looks like to receive love. So one of the questions that we ask ourselves is our checking questions is, how have you felt loved this week? How have you received love? Okay, and so my question for you is when you're racing through this, can you think of ways that you've felt loved by your spouse this week? Now there's there's places in my life when I have not been in in a good mood or a healthy place where I don't know and I feel stumped right? That for me becomes a red flag by saying, am I receiving love this week or am I just doing my own thing? And so when I think about receiving love, I think that we need to be aware enough of how our spouses are trying to love us that we can simply just learn to receive love. Um, Now, side note, don't take this if if you're one of those persons that says, I don't know how I received love this week. That doesn't mean that you're unlovable, that you're not loved. That's not the point that I'm getting at. But I'm simply saying, are you aware how other people are trying to love you? Um, And the second thing that we want to just bring awareness to with this love language conversation is, how are you able to offer love? So offering love, like I said early, it doesn't happen haphazardly. It doesn't just happen. We have to be intentional about it. So when we start looking at the five love languages, these are different ways that we can be intentional about offering love to our spouse. We'll have tendencies to focus on one, and that's okay. But knowing how our our spouse receives invites us into an opportunity to show how we can also offer love. Um, So those are the things that we really just want to just create awareness to of how are you receiving and how are you offering? And now that, now that we're aware of what the love languages are, 
how can that affect your marriage? What things can we can begin to do different? What things can we cultivate differently in our day-to-day life so that we can simply learn how to offer love to our spouse differently? Uh, one thing that I have on my phone uh, that I, I battled about sharing it with a little bit, but every Monday at nine o'clock, I have a reminder on my phone that says, pursue your wife this week. And I don't think that's cheating because there's still creativity that has to go into it. You have to be aware of it and you still have to execute it. But it's a really good reminder to say, hey, how are you trying to love your wife this week? How are you trying to love your spouse this week? And I think those are questions that we can start pushing into in our own life to say, you know what, I really want to show my wife affection. Um, And the side note, this is the other thing that I'm really learning because I'm bad at communicating my emotions. Um, Cognitive, emotional side, I'm very cognitive. Um, But one of the things that I'm learning is whenever I feel loved, I, I almost think it's my obligation to explain and to tell my wife those moments when I feel loved, to affirm those moments. So I'm an acts of service. So whenever my wife makes me coffee in the morning, it really warms my heart and I really, really appreciate it. And so I always try to make it a note to say, thank you for making coffee this morning. Like it makes me really feel loved when you make coffee in the morning for me. And that's just one of the examples that we try to implement. So whenever one of us feels loved, we just try to take that moment instead of waiting and just say, thank you, I feel really loved right now. Um, And so those are some of the things we just try to implement to communicate affection in our marriage. Um, So what are we going to do? We have two questions that are going to kind of wrap up our three-week seminar that we really want to give you guys a couple minutes to focus on. So we're going to take about three to five minutes now. Um, And I want you to think about these because I think these are very practical way to end. And then Pastor Steve's going to come up and just pray um, over the seminar that we experienced. So the two questions is, what's one action step that you're going to take away from the three weeks that we've we've been together? What's one action step? And the last one I think is pretty important. Um, and maybe it's on our side, but we, we hear a lot of conversations of the, the, the stress that goes on in the midst of marriage. But maybe throughout these three weeks, there's something that God's convicted you about. So I want you to think about this question is, what's one thing that you need to recommit to in the midst of your marriage? What's one thing that you need to recommit to in the midst of your marriage? So you guys have about three to five minutes. Talk with your spouse, talk with your table about these things. And then Pastor Steve is going to come up and close us. You can continue to talk at your tables, of course, afterwards, but uh, don't leave your kids up there. If they're in the children's church, go get them. Um, I'm going to share just a couple closing thoughts, and then we're going to pray. Um, I hope it's become apparent to you that marriage is a biblical endeavor, I and mean, that's been emphasized in all three sessions. And one thing, being Christ followers, we have a leg up on this thing, because God instituted marriage And he's told us how to thrive and and do well in marriage. And so remember that. Always remember, your marriage is a biblical endeavor. And ask the Lord God to fill you with the Holy Spirit and to fill your spouse with the Holy Spirit so that you're not just trying to do this thing in your own strength. There's absolutely no reason to do that. Also, I'm going to give you my favorite saying, you made a decision to marry this person. You never go back to that decision. It's done. You get in trouble when you go back and question the decision. What you do now is you live out that decision. And if you have that attitude, whenever you have some kind of trial or some kind of issue, you're going you're gonna to have to work it out. But don't question the decision. Make the decision one time, live out the decision, and then count on the grace of God to give you the feelings to follow that decision. So that's my couple words of advice. But the other thing I would really say to you that's really, really important is this. Pray for your spouse and pray for your family. Pray for your kids and pray for, like in our case, for the, your kids' spouses. Um, I think I do this three to four times a week. I will pray for everyone in our family by name. And it does two things, I think. It unleashes the power of God in their lives for one thing. It also sets your affections on them. What you invest in tends to capture your heart. And so when someone comes to me and says to me, I'm not doing very well with my spouse, you know what the first question I'll ask them is? When did you pray for him or her last? Oh, yeah. That's where you start oftentimes. And it's not about changing your spouse. It's about what? Gracing your heart to view them differently. So what we're going to do today is we're going to end with just a word of prayer. And I'm going to pray over you and pray for you. And I'd encourage you to pray along with me. And as we're going through this couple minutes of prayer, I would encourage you to think of your spouse and pray for them specifically. 
All right, so here we go. Would you bow your heads? Lord God, I want to thank you for this institution of marriage. I want to thank you for three weeks to dive into some of the nuances of it and learn some skills and some methods and learn some biblical principles. And all that is really good, Lord. Uh, But I pray that you would instill into our hearts here tonight just that this is your idea and that you've created us to thrive in marriage. And we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would anoint the marriages here tonight, that you anoint these couples that you'd fill them with your presence and with the power of God. I pray that you'd put the thoughts of Jesus on our minds. I pray that we would think right thoughts about our our mates, Lord, and that you would just uh, uh, anoint our lives in that regard. Lord, I want to thank you that at one point, each couple in here made a decision. They made a vow to be married. And I want to pray that that decision would just be firm and and strong now, Lord. And I pray that, that we wouldn't revisit that decision but rather we would learn how to live it out. Live it out in a way that brings glory to your name. Live it out in a way that uh, really blesses our our spouse and blesses our marriage, Lord. And I pray, Lord, if anyone in here today is feeling a little dry in their marriage, a little bit like, I don't have real strong feelings for my spouse, would you just grace them, Lord, with those feelings? Would you stir it up in them, Lord? But I pray that they would understand that oftentimes those feelings follow decisions, Lord. And I pray that we all here tonight just decide, I'm going to be in love with my mate. I often think of Job's, uh, you know, thoughts here, Lord. He says, I have made a covenant with my eyes not to lust after a young woman, Lord. And I just pray for us that we'd have eyes only for our spouse, that we'd save our affections and, and those kinds of things just for that person. We'd reserve them just for that person, Lord. And then we would freely share them. And Lord, I, I just want to pray that In our households represented here tonight, Jesus, you would be lifted up. You would be the center. I pray that we would be on this journey of transformation, of becoming more like you, thinking more like you, acting more like you, treating others like you would treat them, Lord. And I pray that would start at home. Sometimes I think we're so rude to the one we love the most because we feel comfortable just to kind of be mean or to to just let it hang out there. And I want to pray, Lord, that you would give us reservation in that regard. That instead, we would value that person so much, Lord, that we would be careful of what we say and how we say it, and we'd be edifying one another, building each other up in our most holy faith. Lord, I pray as couples, we spur one another on to good works, Lord, that our homes would become these places of blessing and encouragement and of safety and of intimacy and vulnerability, Lord, um, where we can be ourselves and we can also, Lord, have that, uh, uh, that, that awesome privilege of pouring our life into another individual, uh, Lord, in, in a way that, that helps them. So, Lord, I pray that, that our marriages here would be places where the couples spur one another on, Lord, in their faith and in following after you, where there's just great encouragement that would characterize the marriages. Thank you, Lord, uh, for these last three weeks. And I, just, I just pray a hedge of protection now, a hedge of thorns around each marriage. Lord, I pray you keep the enemy attacks away from us and keep falseness out of the midst of our marriages, Lord. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that our homes would be places where, Jesus, you are reigning supreme and we're growing in our, our, our likeness to you and growing in our love one for another. In your name, Jesus, I pray these things. Amen.